Welcome to the John Gets Games tutorial for Red Rising. In this video, I'll be teaching the rules to the game as it's being played, and I will be showing one full three-player game today. Now, I do want to mention that the only reason this video is being made is because it won the monthly poll that is voted on by the Patreon supporters of this channel. If you enjoy videos like this one, then I would hope that you would consider directly supporting the channel like many others have, and you can learn more about that by going to patreon.com slash Games. The last thing I'd like to ask is that if you enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. All right, let's jump into the game. Out here, we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Before I start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles, because I might make mistakes as I'm showing you the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them. I will also put corrections below this video in a pinned comment. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. It is set in the futuristic universe of Red Rising, which is based on a book series by Pierce Brown, and in that series, society is divided up into 14 casts. Now, in this game, each player is in control of a house who is attempting to rise to power as they piece together an assortment of followers throughout the game, and once the game is over, the player with the most victory points will be the winner. Now, on a player's turn, they are going to either lead by placing a card from their hand onto one of these stacks. They will then potentially perform an effect listed on that card. Then they will take a card from a different stack and bring it into their hand and gain a benefit for the specific spot where they took that card. That means they will play a card and draw a card, so they will keep the same number of cards in their hand. They will just have different cards at that point. The other thing you can do on your turn is Scout, where you draw the top card from this deck and then place it face up onto one of these stacks. Then you take the bonus of that specific area, and once again you have not added cards into your hand. There are ways to increase or decrease your hand size through various effects in the game, but there aren't that many of those effects in the main deck. So we will all keep taking turns where we either lead a card from our hand or scout a card from the top of the deck, and we will keep going until the game is over. At that point, we will count up our victory points, and most of those points will come from the cards that are in our hand once the game is over. The cards can have static numbers on them of points, and many of them also have conditional points that you'll get once the game is over. So this game is all about making sure you have the best hand of cards once it is over to get as many points as possible. Players will also gain points for the helium they have acquired, the fleet track positioning of their token, as well as the influence cubes that they've put into the Institute, and I'll describe the details of how all of this works while we are playing the game. On that note, I do think let's start playing the game, and for today's tutorial, we are going to play as the yellow player who is in control of House Apollo. Speaking of Apollo, let's begin by focusing over here. Now, each player has one of these tiles, which is associated with one of the houses in the game, and there are six of these tiles to choose from, and we all got these randomly at the start. These not only dictate our color, but also some special effects that only apply to us in the game. And as you can see for Apollo, it says that we are going to take the first and last turns in the game. Now that is the reason why we have this first player token. If anyone is playing Apollo, they take this and they keep it. But if no one is playing Apollo, you just randomly select one player to take this token. And then whoever gets that token will keep it for the entire game. Now, in addition to always having the first player token, the Apollo House also has a Sovereign Token ability down here. In fact, every one of these tiles has a Sovereign Token ability, and I'll describe what the Sovereign Token is and how these abilities work later on in the tutorial. Now, at this point, we can begin the game, and we are the starting player because we have this starting player token in front of us. That means we can now take the first turn of the game. For our turn, we can either do a lead action or a scout action. Now, the scout action involves us drawing the top card randomly from this deck. We then place it face up onto one of the stacks, and then we gain the benefit of that specific area, which is Jupiter, Mars, Luna, and the Institute. Now, I'll talk about those specific benefits soon, and after you play that card face up onto the stack and get that benefit, your turn is done. You don't gain any benefits from the card played. Instead of scouting, we could lead, which means we take a card from our hand and we deploy it onto one of the stacks. The word deploy is important because that allows you to perform the deploy effects, which look like this on the card that you played down. Again, when you do a scout action, you take a card from the top and you place it down so you do not activate those deploy effects. For our first turn, I think let's lead and let's use this administrator. Now that means we have to take this card from our hand and deploy it down onto one of these stacks and then potentially perform this effect. I think we want to deploy this one over onto the Institute, which means we are going to place it so that it overlaps most of the previous card, but we still see everything along the top. 
It is worth noting that players are always allowed to inspect all of the cards on any of these stacks, but you cannot change the ordering of those cards when you are taking a closer look at them. So we've now deployed the administrator, and we can now look down here to the deploy effect. It says, if deployed onto the Institute, we reveal the top two cards from the deck and place them underneath this card in any order of our choosing. We did indeed deploy the administrator into the Institute, which means we can now draw those two cards and then place them underneath the administrator in any order of our choosing, and I think we'll place them like this. After performing that deploy effect, we can now continue on with our lead action, where we are going to gain a new card. Now we can either take the top card from one of the locations that we did not deploy onto, or we can take the top card from the deck. Now I think we do want to take this card over here, and after taking that card, it will go into our hand where we once again have five cards, and then we will perform the effect of the location we just took that card from. Now we just took the card from Jupiter, which means we will perform a Jupiter effect. The effect for Jupiter is quite simple. We are just going to move our fleet token to the right once on the fleet track. We started at zero and now we are at one. And the number underneath it with the laurels is the amount of victory points we will get at the end of the game if our token is on that location. So by moving this over, we just gained one victory point. Now I do want to mention that if we had decided to instead take the top card from the deck, then we would have rolled the rising die and we would have gained the effect of that die and I'll describe the details of what these are later on in the tutorial. Well, our turn is done, which means play is going to move clockwise over to the purple Minerva player and just like always, they can either lead or scout for their turn. After considering their options, they want to lead and they are going to be deploying Aegis Craftsman down onto Luna. Next up, it's time for the deploy effect of that card. This says that they may gain a gold card from this location, and if they do, they will end their turn at that point. Now it's worth noting this says you may, which means this is an option, whereas other deploy effects like this administrator that we saw already did not say may, so that effect needed to be performed as much as it was possible to. Well, Purple just deployed this card, and they are going to use this ability. As you can see, there is one gold card in this location where they deployed the Aegis Craftsman, and they do want that card. So they are going to gain this card, which is Lysander. That will go into their hand, and now they end their turn. Remember, on our turn, after we deployed, we then gained one card from a location, but in this case, since it says their turn immediately ends, they do not perform any other parts of the lead action. Purple is done, which means the green player can go. After considering their options, they want to lead with Uncle Narrow. Now they are going to deploy this down into the Institute. There are a bunch of cards over here, and it is worth noting that there is no limit to the number of cards in each of these four locations. Now they can do the deploy effect, and that says that they are going to gain to Helium. Now Helium is represented with these red tokens. So the green player can take two of these, and every helium that you have at the end of the game is worth three points. So that means they just gained six points by taking these tokens. It's worth noting that some of the card effects in the game interact with the helium that you have, and helium is one of the end game triggers, which I will discuss in greater detail later on. After that deploy effect, they have to gain a card from one of the other locations, and they want to gain this card here. Since that came from the Mars location, they will now perform the Mars effect, and that simply lets them gain one helium, and that is once again worth three points at the end of the game, so they gained three helium total on this turn. Well, green is done with their turn, which means it's now time for us to go again, and before we decide if we want to lead or scout, let's take a closer look at all of the cards that we have in our hand. Now, as you can see, each card has a number in the top left corner, and that is the number of victory points that card will get us at the end of the game if it is still in our hand. In addition to that, every card also has other ways to get victory points or potentially lose points, and those are listed in the bottom area of the card. For example, this janitor right here says it will be worth 5 extra points for every green, yellow, and blue card that is within your hand once the game is over, and there is a helpful reminder over here showing that the janitor wants to be in a hand with other green, yellow, and blue cards. So, if we are planning on keeping the janitor in our hand for the long run, then we would also want to try and collect green, yellow, and blue cards. Now, if we played the janitor out deploying it onto one of these stacks, then we would get to this ability, which says if we deploy it directly on top of a green, yellow, or blue card, we could then move that card to the top of another location and advance once on the fleet track. Remember, the fleet track will be worth more points at the end of the game, depending on how far you've moved your token down it. 
Now, at the moment, if we were to deploy the janitor, there are no green, yellow, or blue cards to put it directly down onto, so we would not get this benefit, so this is probably not a good card to lead with right now. The next card to take a look at is Darrow. That is worth 10 points at the end of the game, and it's worth an additional 30 points if you have 7 or more cards in your hand, including Darrow. We currently have five cards in our hand, and there are other ways to gain more cards based off of certain card effects. And if we had lots of cards, then obviously adding 30 points to that 10 is a great way to get points at the end of the game. Now, if we were to deploy Darrow, it says we would gain any non-gold from the location where we deployed Darrow, and then we would have to banish Darrow unless we deployed him on top of a gold. Now, at the moment, there are no golds at the top of any of these locations. So if we deployed Darrow down on top of one of them, we would banish Darrow from the game. Now, banished cards go off to the side, and they all stay face-up because those could affect certain endgame scoring conditions on cards. The next card that we have is Scyther. That's worth 14 points at the end of the game, plus an additional 16 points if we have at least one blue card within our hand. So having multiple blues will not affect this, just having one would be enough to get those extra 16 points, making this a 30-point card overall. Now, if we deployed Scyther, then it says we may gain a blue from this location, and if we do, we immediately end our turn. At the moment, we can look out here, though, and see that there are no blue cards on any of the locations, so I don't think now is a good time to deploy this card. The next card that we have is the Conversationalist. It's worth 15 points at the end of the game, plus an additional 15 if we have at least one white in our hand. And if we decided instead to deploy this card, we could then move the top card from another location under this card, and if it was a white card that moved, then we would gain it into our hand. Since this does not say it would end our turn, then after deploying it, we would draw a card, which means by activating this deploy effect, we would end up drawing two cards and only playing one. So this is one of the cards that would let us increase our hand size. The last card that we have is the Howlers. This is worth 20 points at the end of the game, plus an additional 15, if with Severo. Now, Severo is a specific card, and we can see a little icon over there showing that card. So if we have that pair, then obviously that is a bunch more points we can get. Now, this card has a new icon on it. It says, when an opponent tries to steal or banish your cards, reveal this to block them. Now, that means you simply uh, take it from your hand and you show it to that opponent, and unless otherwise stated, you put it back into your hand, and that shield icon is there to remind you that this can be used to block incoming effects. So, those are all of the cards that we have at the moment, and we could obviously try to play for the extra points listed on the bottom of each, uh, but if we deploy one of these cards, then that won't be in our hand unless we find a way to pull it back into our hand later. Now, I think for this turn, we actually want to do a scout action. I don't desperately want to play any of these right now since they do have some good abilities, but it seems most of those abilities are not active right now based off of the cards that are on the board. For example, both of these cards would increase our hand size by one if we were able to utilize the full deploy effect, but Darrow would need a uh, gold card to be on the top of one of these stacks and there aren't, and the conversationalist would need a white card to be on the top. So I think instead we are going to scout for our turn, and that means we draw the top card from this deck and we immediately place it onto one of these locations. Now I say place instead of deploy because we do not activate the deploy effect on that card. Now with that in mind, we should still take a look at this card. It's worth 20 points at the end of the game for a player who has it in their hand, and as a deploy effect, it says you can gain the bottom card on this location if it's not this card, and then you banish Victra unless you deployed her onto a gold card. This also says at the end of the game, Victra is worth 10 points if it's with the Howlers, and 10 more points if with Severo or Darrow. Now, those scoring conditions are very interesting considering we have Darrow and the Howlers. So if we had Victra in our hand and these two cards, then Victra would be worth 20 plus 10 plus 10, or 40 points total. Now, obviously, Victra is going out here onto the board, but I am more interested in bringing this card into our hand than I was before. Now, we do have to put this onto one of the locations, and then after that, we are going to activate the effect of that specific location. With that in mind, let's place the scouted card onto Luna, and now we can activate the Luna effect. The way this works is we are going to take the Sovereign token from wherever it is and put it in front of us. At the beginning of the game, it starts off to the side, so we can place this over here. And it's worth noting, if we already had the Sovereign token over here and we activated Luna, we would simply keep it in front of ourselves, but then continue on as if we had pulled it from somewhere else. After we have taken the Sovereign token from anywhere, including from in front of ourselves, and placed it back in front, we then activate the effect on our house card. For us, the Apollo effect says whenever we gain the Sovereign token, even if we already had it, we can then reveal and place, but not deploy, the top card from the deck onto any location.
Now that should seem familiar because it's actually what we just did for a scout action. So that means as Apollo, every time we get the Sovereign token, we effectively do a scouting action, placing a card down, but we do not activate the effect of the location we place that card onto. The reason I wanted to activate our Sovereign ability is because we have cards in our hand that want to activate based off of conditions that don't actually match up out here. Now, Darrow would activate now since there is a gold card we could play onto, but we know that Scyther wants there to be a blue card, and currently we don't see any, and then the Conversationalist wants a white card on top. So we're going to draw this card, and if it's blue or white, then that could work out for us, and it looks like it isn't. But again, by digging into this deck, we have increased our odds of setting ourselves up for a situation that works out good for us. Now this is Severo, and that sounds familiar because if you remember, the Howlers is going to be worth 15 more points if they are in a hand with Severo at the same time. And also, Victra is worth uh, 10 extra points if with Severo or Darrow. So we're seeing a lot of these cards that combo well with each other, and this card as a deploy effect says that you banish the card directly underneath this one, and then you may reveal the Howlers to instead gain that card. Remember, otherwise it would have been banished. Severo is worth 15 points at the end of the game, plus 20 more points if with Victra, the Howlers, or any red card. Now, I think we are going to place this one down onto Mars. Well, that's completed our Sovereign action, and that has also completed our Scouting turn, so that means it's time for the Purple player to go. After thinking through their options, Purple has decided to lead by deploying the packs down onto Luna. Now that has a deploy effect that says if deployed onto Luna, they get to advance once on the fleet track. So purple will go up once on the fleet track, and they are now tied with us at the one position. After that, because they took a lead action, they have to take one card from the top of one other location, remember not the one that they deployed onto. Now they've decided to take Uncle Neryl from the Institute, and then they get to activate the effect of the location where they gained that card from. That means they are going to do an Institute action, and the way this works is they are going to take one of their Influence Cubes and place it over here into the Institute. Once placed into the Institute, Influence Cubes will stay there for the rest of the game, where they will be worth a variable amount of points once the game is over. If you have the most cubes or tied for the most once the game is over, then each of your Influence Cubes will be worth 4 points to you. If you have the second most or tied for the second most cubes in the Institute, then each of your cubes will be worth 2 points, and in any other case, you will get 1 point for each cube in the Institute once the game is over. So, technically, the purple player is currently in the lead at the Institute, with one cube compared to zero of their opponents, so that means this cube is worth four victory points, and it will stay that way until somebody else has more cubes in the Institute than the purple player does. Well, purple is done, which means the green player can now go. After considering their options, they want to do a lead action, and they are going to use Karnas. Now, they are going to deploy Karnas onto Mars... And then the deploy ability says they are going to banish the card directly underneath this one. If the banished card is Mustang, the Jackal, or Nero, then you also choose an opponent. And if you do, that opponent has to banish one of their cards as well. In this case, the card underneath Karnas is Severo, and that is obviously not Mustang, the Jackal, or Nero. That means the secondary effect that would have attacked one of their opponents is not going to be activated, which is probably a good thing. Uh, we certainly don't want to have to banish cards from our hand. Then again, if they had tried to do that and targeted us, we could have revealed our Howlers to stop that. Of course, they could have targeted the purple player and banished one of their cards, which we would have been fine with. Either way, that effect is not going to activate, but the main part will, which means Severo is banished. So, we can place this card into the banished area, which is any area near the board. And when we banish other cards, we have to make sure that all cards are easily visible over here in the banished area. Now, I'm certainly bummed to see that happen. We were hoping to bring Severo into our hand to get extra points for the Howlers, and with Severo now being banished, I think it might make sense to actually get rid of this before the end of the game, considering we aren't going to be able to get those 15 extra points. Now, there are technically ways to pull cards from the banished area back into the game, but they are rare. There's actually one of them currently out here on the board, and that is this researcher over at the Institute. That says, as a deploy effect, you can place a random banished card to the bottom of this specific location. Obviously, the bottom is in the very back, which means it might be hard to bring that card into your hand, but there are lots of ways to dig into these stacks, and also, cards might just get peeled off until the one that you want is found. 
So obviously right now there's just one card in the banished area. So the random card would be that one. So if we found a way to deploy this researcher to get Severo back into play, then maybe that's something we could try to make happen. Or maybe we just focus on other things as we continue to play the game. Well, the green player can continue with their turn. They did a lead action, so they now have to take a card. That can be from any non-Mars location, or they could draw from the top of the deck, and that is what they've decided to do. So this card will go into their hand, and no one else will get to see what it is. And now they get to roll the rising die. This is a D6, and on it there are icons that can show up. Four of these are effects that we already understand. If they roll this, then they would do a Jupiter effect, increasing their fleet track once. If they rolled that, then this would be a Luna effect, getting them the Sovereign token, and then letting them perform their Sovereign ability. Now, their Sovereign ability is pretty simple. It just lets them place one influence into the Institute, so that means the green player might be in a better position going on through the game to put more of their cubes over here. That's certainly something they want to keep in mind as they move forward with their strategy. The next icon on the die is the Mars effect, which means you simply take one of the helium tokens, and then there is also the Institute, which lets you put one of your influence down into the Institute itself. Now that is four out of the six sides, but then there's also this I, and you'll notice that looks a lot like the icon on our Apollo house card. Now that means this effect is actually the same. If you roll that, then you draw the top card from this deck and then place it face up onto one of these decks so you do not do anything but place the card down. The final icon on the rising die is this, and that simply means that you banish the top card from any one of these locations if that is what you roll. Now, at this point, the green player can roll the die, and they got the Jupiter effect, which means they will increase their fleet token once, and all of us are now at the one location on that track. So, green is done, and before we take our turn, I would like to point out the Sovereign effect for our purple opponent. That shows a die at the bottom, and that's because every time they take the Sovereign token, they are going to roll this die and then gain the corresponding bonus. Although, if they roll the Luna side, they have to immediately re-roll until they get a result that is not that side. Well, it is time for our turn, but before we decide what to do, I think we should now discuss how the game will end. In order to do this, let's focus out. Now, the game end is going to be triggered once all three of the end game conditions have been met by any number of players. The first of these is once any player has seven or more helium in front of them. The second is once any player has a fleet track position of seven or more. And the third is once any player has seven or more of their influence over here in the Institute. Now, if there is at least one player who has gotten to all three of those conditions, then we are going to continue playing until everyone has had the same number of turns. There is one other way the game can end, and that is if any one single player has met two out of those three conditions by themselves. So that means if the purple player had seven cubes in the Institute, and they were also at the seven point on this track, then that would trigger the end of the game, even though no players in this example have seven or more of the helium tokens in front of them. In either case, we keep playing until everyone has taken the same number of turns, and we can track that with this token here. And then if anyone is playing Apollo, which we are, then as a bonus for playing that house, that player gets to take one more turn, so the Apollo player always takes one more turn than the rest of the players. It will then be time to activate endgame abilities. Now there are two main endgame abilities, and they are associated with the orange and gray cards that people might have in their hands. For the purpose of example, I'm going to bring these up real quick, and as you can see down at the bottom, there is this end game icon. Now, every single orange card says this following effect, where you can treat this card as having the same name as any specific character. Now, remember, we have the Howlers, which will give us 15 extra points if they are with Severo, and that means if we end the game with the Howlers and a orange card, we could say that this orange card counts as Severo because that is a named card, and that will then get us those extra 15 points. So even though Severo is banished, that does not necessarily mean we won't get these extra points because of these endgame orange abilities. Now the other ability that shows up is on the gray cards. It also activates at this point, and it says you may treat this card as if it was any one other color in addition to being gray. That means every gray card at the end of the game counts as gray, plus one other color of your choice, which could matter when it comes to scoring the other cards that you might have in your hand. After that, players can add up their scores. They will get points from icons that look like this, which score points at the end of the game. You will also get points for the cards that you have in your hand, as well as your position on the fleet track. 
Each of your helium will also be worth three victory points at the end of the game. You will get 10 points as well if you are the player who has the Sovereign token in front of you, so jockeying for this token near the end of the game is definitely something to keep in mind, and then you will get four, two, or one victory point each for your influence cubes in the Institute, depending on if you are in first, second, or third place with those cubes. Finally, you will lose 10 victory points for every card that you have in your hand in excess of seven. That means you could end the game with eight cards in your hand, and you'll score the points on all eight of those cards, but then you will lose ten points because you are in excess by one. So hopefully that eighth card was worth more than ten victory points for you. After adding all of this up, the player who has the most points will be the winner. Now that we understand how the game ends and where we get all of our points, let's continue playing the game some more. Now it is time for us to go, and I think I want to do a lead action with the janitor. This will let us do a deploy effect of increasing our position on the fleet track once if we play this onto a yellow, blue, or green card, and there is one blue card out here that we can play onto. So we will deploy this to Luna, and this specific effect actually moves that green, yellow, or blue card onto a different stack, and then we increase the fleet track location. Now when we move this to another location, that does not change where we deployed to, because we placed the janitor in Luna, this is the area that the deployment happened. What that means is we could place this down into one of these areas, and then for the second part of our lead action, actually pull this card up into our hand, and then of course perform the effect of the uh, location that we pulled this from. Now this card in particular is worth 20 points, plus 15 more points if with Darrow, Severo, Orion, Vega, or Pellis. Now we do have Darrow in our hand, so that means we could get the 35 points for this relatively easily by keeping it in our hand instead of playing it out, so I do think this is a card that we want to take. Now I do also like the idea of pushing the fleet track quite a bit, so let's place this onto Jupiter, and now after we finish deploying, we can take any one of the non-Luna cards that are in the top position. As I said before, I think the packs would be great for us, so let's grab this card and put it into our hand. We will then activate Jupiter, which will increase us once on the fleet track. And of course, I did forget to increase our fleet position once for the gender deploy effect, so we should be up here at the three spot, which is worth six points as opposed to the one point for the one spot. So going up twice gained us five more points. Well, our turn is done, so that means the purple player can go. After considering their options, they want to lead with Lysander, and they are going to deploy them onto Luna. After that, the deployment action says they are going to gain the top card from the deck, so this will go into their hand, and then they will banish Lysander unless they deployed him onto Luna, which is what they did. After that, they can take the top card from a non-Luna spot, and they've decided to go with this administrator here, and then they will activate the Institute, which means they'll put one of their influence cubes into the Institute, and they now have two there compared to the zero of the rest of the players. So, purple is done, which means green can go. And they've decided to lead by playing Evie onto Luna. After that, they will perform this deployment action. And it says they are going to banish Evie and all cards at this location. Then for every gold that was banished, they will place one influence token onto the Institute up to a maximum of three. So all of these cards will be banished. And as you can see, there are two gold cards in here. So that means the green player is going to add two influence into the Institute. And then all of these cards can be placed over here into the banish area so that it's easy to tell what cards are currently over there. After that, they can gain the top card from a non-Luna spot, because Luna is where they deployed to, and they are going to gain this Seer, which lets them do an Institute action to place one more influence down, and they now have a majority of influence there. Well, green is done, which means we now can take our turn. So let's take a closer look at our hand. Now, we got the packs recently, and that is going to be worth 15 extra points if we have Darrow, Severo, Orion, Virga, or Pellis in our hand, and currently we do have Darrow. So that means I am tempted to try and keep both of these in our hand to get those extra points, but if we are keeping Darrow around, we want to get these extra points, which we will only get if we have seven or more cards in our hand, and currently we only have five. Currently, we only have two cards in our hand, which would let us increase our overall hand size. And obviously, if we play Darrow to draw two cards, then Darrow will be out there on the board, and we would have to bring them back into our hand in order to get the extra points for the packs. Now, the packs does get these extra points for a wide variety of characters, so we don't have to have Darrow in our hand. We have other options. And remember, every single orange can act as one named character, so that is another thing to keep in mind. 
well, the game is not that close to being over, and I don't think it makes sense to pigeonhole ourselves on Darrow considering our current hand size situation, so maybe we can try to bring him back. But for now, I think we will actually play Darrow out and hope to match up one of these other things to score that later on. Now, let's go ahead and deploy Darrow over here onto Mars. And the reason for that is because the deploy ability for Darrow says we are going to gain a non-gold card from this location, and then we would banish Darrow unless we deployed him onto a gold card. And as you can see, the next card under there is gold. So that means Darrow is not going to be banished, so we have a possibility of bringing Darrow back into our hand later on in the game. Now this effect lets us gain a non-gold card from this location, and there's only one option, so we can go ahead and gain Dancer and bring that into our hand. Now, Dancer says as a deploy effect, we would gain one helium, and then if we have two or more other reds in our hand, we would reveal them to our opponents and gain two more helium. And at the end of the game, this Dancer is worth eight points, plus 11 points if we have no grays in our hand, and 11 more points if we have no golds in our hand. And again, these icons help us out with that scoring. After that, we have to gain a card from a non-Mars spot, because this is where we deployed, and we can't gain from Luna because there aren't any cards over there. Now, I like the idea of going farther up on this fleet track. The farther we go, the more points each of these jumps is worth. As you can see, going from 3 to 4 will bring us from 6 to 10 points, so that is a 4-point swing. So with that in mind, let's gain this card so that we can activate this Jupiter effect to go up to there. I'm not super crazy about the uh, effects on this card, but I did want to activate Jupiter. Now, this card right here is Jofo. It's worth 10 points at the end of the game. And it's worth 10 more points if with Alfron, and 10 again if with Nero. Jofo does have a deploy ability, which says you may gain Alfron or Nero from this location. And if you do, you regain Jofo. So that means this is good at playing down and picking up the combo card. But currently, neither of those cards are out here on the board. So it looks like our turn is over, and we've now successfully increased our hand size from 5 to 6. So it's now time for the purple player to go. And they've decided to deploy Uncle Neryl over here onto Mars. This deploy effect says they are going to gain two helium. And then when they go to gain a card, they could gain from the Institute to place another influence over here that would tie them up with green. But they've decided they don't really want this card, so instead they are going to gain the top card from this deck. That means they have to roll this rising die, and then this effect says they are going to banish the top card from one of these decks. After considering their options, they are going to banish this Researcher. Alright, purple is done, which means green can go. After considering their options, they are going to lead by playing this Firewall Expert over here onto Luna. The deploy effect for this card says they are going to look at the top three cards from the deck. They are going to place one of them face down on top of three different locations, and these cards are considered colorless while they are face down. After looking at them, they are going to place them down onto locations that don't match where they deployed. So they have to put one of these on Jupiter, one on Mars, and one on the Institute. And they'll put this one here, that one there, and that one will go over there. Now we can take these cards into our hand like normal. We just don't know what they are. Of course, the green player does know what these are. Now after that deploy effect, they now are going to pull one of these into their hand, or of course they could take the top card from the deck, and they have decided to gain this card here, and of course they know what that card is. Since they gained that card from the Institute, they're going to place one of their influence over there, and they have now furthered their influence lead there. Green's turn is done, so now we get to go. We now have six cards in our hand, and one thing that's jumping out to me is the fact that the deploy effect on IO could be pretty good for us. It says that when deployed, each opponent must reveal a red card from their hand. If they don't, they lose one helium, so that could be a way to reduce some points from our opponents. This is also a red card, and we have this Dancer, which has a deploy effect of gaining one helium, but if we reveal two or more red cards from our hand, we get two more helium when placed. At the moment, we only have Dancer for red cards, so if we bring Io up, then we would need just one other red card, which could be Darrow if we could find a way to bring them back into our hand, considering they are getting somewhat buried over there. Now, I was not uh, particularly crazy about this card when we brought it up last turn, so I think let's go ahead and play this one out. And I don't think I want to place this on Mars, considering that'll make it even harder to potentially bring Darrow back into our hand. Instead, let's place this one over here onto Jupiter, so that means this face-down card is not the topmost card anymore. 
Now, after that, we don't do this deploy effect because it does not actually have an effect. It says you uh, may gain Alfrun or Nero from this location, but neither of those characters are at that location. Now, we can take the top card from one of these other stacks, and as I said, I think this one will work out quite well for us. So let's bring that into our hand, and then we will do our first institute action of the game, putting one of our influence down. Now, it's possible this will be worth just one victory point to us if we don't come in first or second, although having just one more token down here would tie us for second with the purple player. So it's not a crazy thing to consider trying to go for second place. Right now, the green player does appear to be in a good spot for trying to secure that first place going into the end game. All right, that's finished up our turn. So the purple player can go, and they've decided to lead with Nero, and they are going to deploy Nero onto Mars. The deploy effect for this says they are going to gain one helium for each red that is at this location. And as you can see, there are currently two red at that location. Remember, this face down card here counts as colorless. So by playing that out, they have gained two more helium. They already had two, so now the purple player has four. Next up, they can gain a card not from Mars because that's where they deployed. Now, if they gained from Luna, then their house effect would activate, letting them roll the rising die, or they could just take a random card from the top, which means they would also roll the die. Considering these options, they are going to take the Firewall Expert. As a endgame scoring condition, this would be worth 22 more points if there is at least one location with no cards on it, or where the top card is face down like that. And so far, these uh, areas, as well as Jupiter, I suppose, are relatively light on cards, so they're hoping they might be able to pull that off in order to get 35 points total for this card if they keep this until the end of the game. If all of these start to get clogged up, then it's likely we'll see them play this before the game is over. Next up, as a bonus for gaining a card from Luna, they're going to take this Sovereign token away from us. Remember, at the end of the game, the person who has this gets 10 points. After that, they can activate their house ability to roll this die, and they got the helium side, which means they'll gain one more helium from the supply. Alright, purple is done, which means green can go. After considering their options, they want to lead, and they're going to place this artificer down onto Mars. The deploy effect says they may gain a gold or another orange from this location, and if they do, they will end their turn immediately. Currently, there are two gold cards they could take, but they've decided they don't want to do that. They would like to instead take another card, because of course when they take another card later on in this turn, they will also get the benefit of the location, whereas they would not get a location benefit for this card gained here. After considering their options, they're going to go to the Institute. At one point, this had a ton of cards on it, but now uh, half of these locations are empty. Now, when they go to the Institute, they of course place one of their influence tokens down, so they now have five influence at the Institute. Before we move on, let's take a closer look at the card they just picked up. This is a 4D Painter, which is worth 9 points, plus an additional 31 points if each card in your hand at the end of the game is a different color. Now this does have a deploy effect that says you can move a card from this location to the top of another location where there are no cards with the same color as it. Alright, green is done, which means we can now go. Now this is a bit of a tricky turn. We have six cards in our hand, and at this point, I feel somewhat tempted to not lose these cards here. First of all, the Howlers gives us protection if somebody tries to steal or banish a card from our hand, and also the Howlers is worth uh, 35 points total if we have Severo. Now, this orange Scyther can act as any one named specific character, so at the end of the game, we could have this orange act as uh, Severo, which means we would get the 35 points here. Then we can see that Scyther is going to be worth 14 plus 16, or 30, if we have a blue, and the Pax is blue. So by keeping this, that means this is a 30-point card, and of course the Pax is worth 20 plus another 15, if we have Darrow, Severo, Orion, Virga, or Pelis. And if we already have this orange acting as Severo for the Howlers, then that's going to activate for this, making that a 35-point card. So that means by keeping this package of three cards in our hand, we are securing 100 endgame victory points. It seems like scoring 30 or more points per card is good, and two of these are getting 35 points, which is why I am tempted to not mess with this combo that we have already. Now that means if we are leading cards, it'll be one of these, and I don't mind leading either of these. In particular, I'd love to lead this one, but this effect will be so much better if we're able to bring in at least one more red card into our hand. Unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have an easy way of getting a red card. We could, of course, gain the top card from the deck, which could be red. We won't know until that happens. And honestly, that is the direction that I'm leaning for this turn. 
If we did that, hoping for another red, that means we are leading this card. And this was the main way I was hoping to increase our hand size even more. That says we would move the top card from another location to under this card, and if it's a white card, we would gain it. So that would be a way to increase our hand size overall, but there has not been that many white cards out here. And currently we would need a white card at the end in order to pull that off. You know what? I don't think I want to wait around for white cards any longer. So let's go ahead and lead this card and not worry about trying to increase our hand size. It seems unlikely we'll be able to bring Darrow back into our hand anyway to get those extra points for having seven or more cards. So let's place this down, and I think we'll go into Luna. And then we do still have to activate this effect that says we move the top card from another location to under this card. Now, I think what we want to do is gain a card from Jupiter so that we can keep moving our fleet token up. And we don't really want Jofo. We've already gained and played Jofo without getting any benefit for that card. So let's target Jofo and put that one underneath the conversation list. That way, when we go to draw a card, we don't have to go random from the top to roll the die. Instead, we can go random from over here to take this card, and then that Jupiter effect will increase us once on the fleet track, which means we just gained five victory points there. Now, the card that we gained is an Obsidian card. It is Cephi. It's worth 20 points at the end of the game, and it's worth another 20 if with Ragnar, and minus five victory points for each gold card it has. So if we are able to find Ragnar or an orange card that could be Ragnar, this would be a 40-point card, which is great. The deploy effect for this card says we would gain another Obsidian from this location. So that means if there was an Obsidian to gain, like Jofo, that would be a way to increase our hand size because this does not immediately end our turn. So maybe that's actually something we'll do on our next turn, placing this over here to gain Jofo and then another card later on to get us up to seven cards. Either way, we'll just have to see what the game state is like on our next turn. This can now go into our hand, and we are now done. That means the purple player can go. Now, before purple takes their turn, I'd like to take a quick glance out to see where we are as far as the end game triggers are concerned. Remember, the game will end if any one player has two out of the three end game conditions, or if between all of the players, each of the three end game conditions are met. Those three conditions are a player having seven or more helium, seven or more fleet track advancements, and a player having seven or more influence at the Institute. Right now, a player has five fleet, another player has five influence, and yet another player has five helium, which means we are well on our way for all three of those end game conditions, but we're not super close just yet. I do think we are well over halfway done with the game, though. After considering their options, they are going to deploy this auctioneer over to the Institute. The deploy effect of that card says they now have to choose one opponent, and that opponent can either gain one helium, advance on the fleet track once, or place one influence onto the institute, and then the purple player will gain both of the other options. So they have to pick us or the green player, and they can tell that we have one more card than the green player currently does, so they've decided to help the green player out. So that means green can gain one helium, one influence, or one fleet track advancement. And green has decided they would like to place the influence down. That means purple will get both of the other benefits. So they will gain one fleet track advancement, which will give them two victory points and one helium. And that is their sixth helium of the game. So they are very close to that end game threshold of seven. Of course, if just one of the three things have that threshold met, that will not end the game. But it does mean that we are getting ever closer. Next up, Purple can gain a card not from the Institute, and you know what? They've decided to go for it. They are going to gain this Artificer from Mars. That means they will do the Mars effect, which gets them a Helium, and they now have seven Helium in front of them. Now, that does not trigger the end of the game. Uh, at least one player would need seven Fleet Advancements, and a player would need seven Influence. Looks like Green is at six there, and we have five Advancements on the Fleet Track. Of course, the game end would be triggered if the purple player got up to seven on either of those other two things. Currently, purple is at the two spot for each of those, so it doesn't look like the game is going to be ending from one player getting two out of the three anytime soon. Well, purple is done, so now green can go. And they've decided to lead by playing this investor onto Mars. The deploy effect for this card says they have to choose a color other than silver, and they then gain one helium for each card of that color at that location. Now, if they had held this card in their hand until the very end of the game, this would have had an effect that they could have chosen one color other than silver and gain one helium for each of that card color 
on specifically Mars, but of course that doesn't give any other victory points. Helium is worth points, so that's not nothing, but they decided to play this one out now, and they are going to choose, well, they could go red or gold. Both of those will get them two helium, so they'll just take the two helium, and we'll say they went with red. Now this means the green player is at five helium total, and remember that every helium is worth three points at the end of the game, so that just got them six points. After that, they are going to gain a card. They could go from the top of the deck or from either of these spots, and they're going to gain this Conversationalist. That will activate Luna, which means green is going to take the Sovereign Token, and then their house effect lets them place one of their influence down into the Institute. Now, that is their seventh influence, so that is yet another of the three endgame conditions. Now, the endgame trigger won't happen until all three of them have been met by any number of players, but that does mean if we go up two more times on this fleet track, that will trigger the end of the game. So we are kind of in control right now of the tempo of the game. We could just push for some fleet advancements to end the game soon if we wanted to. Well, it is now our turn, and I think let's lead Sefi. We're going to place Sefi over here onto Luna, and then the deploy effect says we gain another obsidian from this location. So that means we are going to gain Jofo, and then after that we get to gain a card from the top of any location that we did not lead to, and that was Luna. Now part of me does want to go up on this Jupiter track, but there aren't any cards over here to actually take so that we could gain that benefit. Now our other two options are the Auctioneer and the Investor over there, Neither of them explicitly give a set number of points at the end of the game, although this auctioneer would let us gain one helium, advance once on the fleet track, or place one influence. Now this fleet track does get better and better as the uh, advancements go, so that means if we took this one and used it for the fleet track, it would be worth a minimum of, I guess, six victory points, although at this point I think it's likely we'll get up to the seven spot, and a bump from seven to eight is an advancement of, yeah, six points again. So yeah, that would be worth six points, making this not a very strong card overall. You know what? I think we're going to go random from the top of the deck. This one is a yellow card. It's a group counselor. It's worth 35 points by itself, and it's worth negative one point for every banished card. Currently, there are eight banished cards, so that means this would actually be worth 27 points, which is still not bad, but uh, maybe not good enough to keep around. Uh, this does have a deploy effect that says we can choose up to three banished cards and place uh, each of them either on top or the bottom of the deck, so that is something that we will potentially do, although again, 27 points is not a bad thing to have around. Next up, we can roll the die because we did gain a card from the top of the deck, and okay, that one means we can take the top card from the deck and place it face up onto any one of these locations. That card is Justice, which is a white card. It's worth 15 points, and as an end game effect, it says if you have the Sovereign token and this card in your hand, you can gain one card of your choice from Luna. This also has a blocking symbol and an effect that says you may reveal this whenever an opponent tries to take the Sovereign token from you. If you do, you banish this card to keep the token, and then you gain the top card from the deck. Now, I think we want to put this face up onto Jupiter so that we could potentially take this on our next turn to advance our fleet track token once. Also, having this card would not be a bad thing overall, I don't think. Um, either way, that has finished up our turn, and at this point, we now have seven cards in our hand. So it would be great to pull Darrow back up, but we have not yet found an effect to make that happen. With our turn done, Purple can go. After considering their options, they are going to lead with this administrator, and they're going to place it onto the Institute. It says, if deployed at the Institute, they reveal the top two cards on the deck and place them underneath this card. So they're going to reveal these two cards here. It looks like they are both orange. Uh, this one has a deploy effect saying you may gain an obsidian from this location, and if you do, you end your turn. And that one says you may gain a gray from the location, and if you do, you end your turn. Now they're going to put them down like this, and then that administrator will go on top. After that, Purple can gain one of these cards or from the top of the deck. And they've decided to take Justice from Jupiter. That means Purple is going to go up once on the fleet track, and that has finished up their turn. So, Green can go. After considering their options, they are going to lead with the Seer, and they're going to place that down onto the Institute. That says if they have the Sovereign token, which they do, they can reveal the top card from the deck and place it without deploying onto any other location. So, they can draw the top card, and it is Morningstar. 
This is worth 35 points, and it's worth negative 15, unless you also have Orion, Vega, or Pelis in your hand. So uh, 20 points is still not too bad, and it says if deployed on Jupiter, you advance once on the fleet track. Now they've decided they are going to place this one over onto this spot here. And then to finish out their lead turn, they have to gain one of these cards or from the top of the deck, and they are going to gain Morningstar. That Seer let them get access to a pretty good card here, and of course, since they gained it from Jupiter, they are going to advance once on that fleet track. Green's turn is done, which means we now get to go again. Now, one thing that jumps out to me is the fact that Nero has been revealed. Now, the Jofo effect says you may gain Alfron or Nero from this location, and if you do, you regain Jofo and end your turn, which means you actually increase your hand size yet again. Now, I think let's go for it. Let's uh, go ahead and deploy onto Mars, and then this deploy effect lets us gain Alfron or Nero, and Nero is here at that location. So Nero is going to go into our hand, and then since we gained one of those two, Jofo also comes back into our hand, and then our turn is done. Now Nero is worth 25 points, and another 10 points if we have the Sovereign token at the end of the game, but we do lose 5 points if we have Cassius, Carnus, or Octavia in our hand. But at the moment, we don't have any of those cards in our hand, so that looks to be a 25-point card, and maybe even more if we're able to take the Sovereign token. Remember, we are Apollo, which means no matter what, we are going to take the final turn of the game. So we could use that final turn to take the Sovereign Token, which is, of course, worth 10 points by itself, and then 10 more points if we have Nero. So I think that worked out pretty well for us. So our turn is done, which means Purple can go. And they've decided to lead with the Firewall Expert. We've seen this one before. It says they can look at the top three cards of the deck and then place one of them face down on the other locations that they don't deploy to and they are going to deploy over here to Mars. So they're going to draw the top three cards from the deck, and then they've decided to place those cards down like that, and after that they can gain one of these cards, and they'll gain this one here. Since that's from Jupiter, they'll advance once on the fleet track, which means they go from three to four, which did just gain them four points. Purple is done, so now green can go, and they've decided to play the 4D Painter. They're going to put that down onto the Institute, and it says they can move one card from this location to the top of another location where there are no cards with the same color as it. And they have decided they are going to move one of these orange cards. They're not sure which. Remember, you can always look at all of the cards as long as you put them back in the same order. They've decided to take Pulse Fist Engineer, and they're going to move that over to Jupiter. Then the Pulse Armor will go back onto the Institute, and now when they gain a card, they are going to gain this card over here. So it seems like everyone is going after the fleet track right now, but we're having a hard time actually advancing, even though we are the farthest up. That might not be the case for long, but either way, green is going to advance once for gaining a card from Jupiter. Green is done, which means we can go, and we have a whopping eight card hand now. For our turn, I think let's lead with the group counselor, and this says we can choose up to three banished cards and place each of them either on top or on the bottom of the deck. Now it does say up to three, so I think what I want to do is actually take Severo and put him back on top of the deck. Then for the second half of our turn, we can gain one card, and let's gain the top card from this deck, which is going to be Severo. And the reason for that is because I actually plan to play Severo. I know that with these Howlers, we gain the uh, extra 15 points for having both of those together, but we already have this orange to act as Severo, and the Severo effect is pretty powerful. When deployed, it says you can banish the card directly under this one, or if you reveal the Howlers, which is in our hand already, you can gain that card instead of banishing it. So this is yet another way to increase our hand size even more, which has been something we've been focusing on quite a bit this game. Either way, Severo now goes into our hand, and since we drew a random card from the top of the deck, we have to roll this die, and oh, it looks like we have to banish the top card from one of the locations. Well, considering this 4D painter could be worth up to 40 points, I think let's go ahead and banish that one so that our opponents don't have a chance to get those points. All right, our turn is done, which means purple can go. After considering their options, they are going to play Pellis, and they are going to play that card down onto Mars. Then, as a deploy effect, it says they are going to advance twice on the fleet track, and then all other players advance once. So, we go up to six, green goes up to four, and purple goes up to six as well. 
After that, they can gain a card, and they will gain this one here. And since they gained that from Luna, they are going to take the Sovereign Token. After that, they can roll the die because that is their house benefit. And, oh, it looks like they are going to advance on the fleet track one more time. That brings them from 6 up to 7, and that is going to trigger one of the endgame conditions. That's because Purple has 7 or more on the fleet track, and they have 7 or more helium. And once any one player has 2 out of the 3 conditions, then that triggers the end of the game. Now this means we are going to continue playing until everyone has had the same number of turns, and then of course as Apollo we get to take one bonus turn. This means green can go, and this is going to be their final turn. After considering their options, they are going to play the Conversationalist onto Mars. That lets them move the top card from another location to under this card, and if it's white, they gain that card. It looks like they don't want us to have an option of going up on the fleet track easily, because they're going to take this card and put it underneath. It's not white, so obviously they don't gain it. And then when they go to take a card from a location they didn't deploy to, they are going to take Cephi from Luna. That means they are going to take the Sovereign Token. Although when they go to take that from the purple player, purple is going to reveal justice. Now that says they may reveal this whenever an opponent tries to take the Sovereign Token from them. If you do, you banish this Justice card and you keep the Sovereign Token, and then you gain the top card from the deck. So that means justice is gone. Purple will keep the Sovereign Token, and then they also get a random card from the top of the deck. Unfortunately, that is it for the green player. They would only get to place another influence down if they gained the Sovereign Token, which of course they weren't able to because that was deflected. We did see the purple player take that Justice card, but it looks like the green player still felt like that was the best turn for them. Well, green is done, and now we have all taken the same number of turns, which means normally the game would be over, but again, as Apollo, we take the first and last turn, with the last turn being a bonus turn. So we can now take a turn, and this will be the final one of the game. Now, I know I was planning on playing Severo out to gain another card with the Howler's combo, but I think at this point, the best thing for us is probably just to play Dancer to then get more points for them. Uh, this is worth 8 points, plus 11 if we have no Grays, and we don't have any Grays, so that means that is 19 points, but it's worth another 11 if we have no Golds and we have a lot of Gold cards. So that means this is a 19-point card, and we can play it right now to gain a Helium, which gets us 3 points, and then we can gain another card into our hand to hopefully get more points for it, although now that I look out here, we can gain that card, that card, or this one, and both of those are face down. The Conversationalist is worth 15 or 30 points if we had a white card in our hand, but we do not have any whites. So I'm not actually positive that we would upgrade our victory points by playing Dancer out. Actually, when I look at Io, this is worth 10 points plus another 10 for every red card we have. So keeping Dancer around is worth 10 more points to us there. So maybe we actually shouldn't play that card. You know what? I think the best thing that we can do is just gain the Sovereign Token, and that will get us 10 more points for Nero, as well as 10 more points for the Sovereign Token itself. Now, we can't actually gain a card from Luna to get that token, but instead of leading one of these cards, we could scout and then perform the action for the place where we put that card down, and so I think that's what we're going to do. We are going to scout this card. It is a Pathologist, and we are just going to place that onto Luna to then take the Sovereign Token. Purple can no longer defend against this because they did banish the card that let them keep it. So that means we take this card, and then we also get to reveal the top card from the deck and place this down onto any location. But at this point, it honestly doesn't matter. Either way, we can take a look at it. It is the Hacker. It's worth 15 points, and at the end of the game, it lets you reveal the top card from the deck and gain points equal to that card's core value. So that could potentially be worth a ton of points if you had them, but no one is going to have this in their hand. Let's just toss this over onto Jupiter, and that finished our turn, and that also means the game is over. So all players can now reveal any orange and or gray cards they have in their hand and decide what to do with those abilities. For us, we just have this one orange. It's Scyther, and that lets us treat this card as if it was any one other specific card. And I think, considering we have Severo now, let's say that Scyther is going to act as Alfren to gain extra points for Jofo here. Now we can look at the purple player's hand, and they also have one orange. They've decided this is going to act as Octavia, and then the green player also has one orange, and they've decided that is going to act as Ragnar. It doesn't look like any of us have the gray cards, which could act as a gray card or another color. Uh, it just turns out that none of us have those in our hands. 
So we can now start scoring, and the first thing to score are specific endgame abilities that could give points. For us, it looks like we don't have any of those printed down below. We can then look at the purple player's hand, and they also don't have any of those abilities, and the green player also doesn't have any of those, so no one gets any points for those. Remember, that could be something like this hacker, which lets you draw the top card from the deck and get points equal to the core value cost of that card. So no one has any of those, and now we can just add up the values of the core points on our cards plus abilities to get more points from those cards. Well, we can start with ourselves. So Scyther is going to be worth 14 points and another 16 if we have a blue, and we do indeed have one. So that means Scyther is going to be worth 30 points to us. Next up, we have Jofo, who is worth 10 points, plus 10 if we have Alfron, and 10 more if we have Nero. We do have Nero, and we're saying that this orange Scyther counts as an Alfron, so that means we will get 30 points for Jofo. After that, we have Nero, who is worth 25 points, plus 10 points if we have the Sovereign token, which we do, and minus 5 points each for having Cassius, Carnus, and Octavia, but we don't have any of those. So that is 25 plus 10, or 35 points. And then Io is going to get us 10 points, plus 10 more points for each red we have, and then minus 10 points for every gray that we have, except for Bridge. We don't have any grays, and we have one other red, so that's 10 plus 10, or 20 points. And then Dancer is worth 8 points, plus 11 if we have no grays, and we do not have any grays. This one is Obsidian. And then 11 points if we had no golds, but obviously we have a lot of golds. So that is going to be 19 more points for us. After that, Severo is worth 15 points, plus 20 points if we have Victra, the Howlers, or a red. We have the Howlers as well as a red, so that means we will get those 35 points. After that, the Howlers is worth 20 points, plus 15 if we have Severo, which we do, so that is 35 more points. Finally, the Pax is worth 20 points, plus 15 if we have Darrow, Severo, Orion, Virga, or Pelis, and we do indeed have Severo, so that is another 35 points for us. All told, we got 239 points for these cards. Next up, the purple player is going to get 10 points for this Artificer, plus 20 points if they have both another orange and a gold in their hand. They do have golds, but they don't have any other oranges, so that is unfortunately just worth 10 points to them. After that, Aja is worth 15 points, plus 15 if they have Octavia. And remember, this Artificer counts as Octavia, so that is 30 points. After that, the Ash Lord is worth 25 points, plus 5 points for each blue they have, and unfortunately they don't have any blue, and they get 5 more points for each Banished Blue. Once again, unfortunately there are no Banished Blues, so they're just going to get 25 points for the Ash Lord. After that, they will get 20 points for Mustang, plus 5 more points for each different color they have. It appears they have orange, gold, copper, as well as silver which means they will get 20 more points, so that is 40 points total for Mustang. After that, this politician is worth 15 points, plus 15 more if they have the most influence at the Institute, or tied for the most, and that did not happen. They have 2 compared to the 7 of green, so they just get 15 for that. Finally, this stockbroker is worth 5 points for each helium they have, up to a maximum of 25 points, plus another 10, and they have uh, easily enough to get to that max, so that's 25 plus 10, or 35 more points. So they got 155, which is significantly less than us, but remember we are going to be losing points for having cards over 7. Finally, we can score green. They are going to get 12 points for this Pulse Fist Engineer, and 18 more points if they have an Obsidian card. And they do indeed have one Obsidian card. So that is going to be 12 plus 18, or 30 points. After that, Sefi is worth 20 points, plus 20 more if they have Ragnar, and minus 5 for each gold card they have. They don't have any gold, and they did say that this Pulse Fist Engineer is going to act as Ragnar, so Sefi will be a 40-point card for them. Next up, Morningstar is worth 35 points, minus 15 if they don't have Orion, Virga, or Pelis, and they do have Orion, so that's 35 points. And then Orion is worth 18 points, plus 10 points if they have Pax Al Telemannus, or the Pax, which they don't, and then they also gain points equal to their position on the fleet track, which will be 0 to 10 points. Green is at the 4 spot. So they get 4 more points, which means they get 22 points total for Orion. Lastly, their sponsor is worth 2 points for each influence token they have at the Institute, plus 20 more. And they do have 7 influence at the Institute, 
So that's 20 plus 14, or 34 points. All told, Green got 161 points from those cards. Next up, we can score for the fleet positions. Green is going to get 10 points. We are going to get 21. And then the purple player is going to get 28. After that, we can score for helium. Remember, each helium is worth 3 points at the end of the game. It looks like the purple player has 7, so that means purple is going to get 21 more points. We have 0 helium, <laughs> that's not something we focused on, so we get 0 points. And then the green player has 5, so that's 5 times 3, or 15 more points for them. Next up, the player who has the sovereign token gets 10 points, and that is going to be us. And then we can score the institute. Now the player who has the most cubes over here will get 4 points per cube, second most will get 2 points per cube, and everyone else will get 1 point. We have just 1 cube over here, and we are in 3rd place, so we are going to get just 1 point for that cube. The purple player is in 2nd place, so that will be 2 plus 2, or 4 points for them. And then the green player will get 7 times 4, or 28 points for these cubes. Finally, we have to count up our cards, and we will all lose 10 points for every card that we have over 7. Now over here, the purple player ended with six cards. The green player ended with just five cards. They never gained any more cards. And we ended with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we have just one more than seven. So that means we're only going to lose 10 points there. After that, I just need to add up the points to see who's the winner. When we add all of this up, we win with 261, green comes in second with 214, and purple comes in third with 208. It looks like our card advantage really did work out for us there at the end. Well, that has completed one full three-player game of Red Rising, and that is also going to bring this tutorial to a close. I hope that you've enjoyed learning how to play the game. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.